though we may not like to believe it, elites do serve a purpose in society and there is a place for elitism. For example, for our academic institutions to be worth anything, we need an academic elite. We need institutions like Oxford and Cambridge and some of the great universities of the world to have a sense of elitism about them. We need them to have strict entrance requirements so that only the best people, only the most gifted and able people are able to get into these institutions so that the best work can be produced. We need a military elite which has similarly difficult requirements. In other words, if you believe that producing things of very high quality is a good idea, then you need to also believe in elitism. Now, I know that there are some elites who you might say simply benefit from their elite status without actually contributing anything to society. And that's perfectly true. There will be some elites who benefit in this way and produce absolutely nothing for anyone else to benefit from. But the same can obviously be said at the other end of the spectrum. There are clearly poor people who make no attempts to improve their lives, who simply rely on the state and the generosity of the benefit system and have no desire to change that arrangement. So it can be said that people at both ends of the spectrum, there are some people at both ends of the spectrum who benefit without contributing properly. Now, of course, the existence of, of, of this reality is not exactly an argument against elitism per se. Just because I can point out that there are some poor people who don't benefit the rest of society, who just scrounge effectively. Just because I can point that out, that of course doesn't mean that we should accept that or indeed accept the problem at the other end of the spectrum. I completely understand that. However, I'm not entirely sure how you can get rid of this problem. I think there are some sensible limitations which you could put on elites. For instance, we could make it illegal for political parties to accept donations from businesses or from you know particularly wealthy elites, let's say. That would be a good move, in my opinion. That would make the political system fairer. But to simply do away with all elites who don't contribute to society enough seems to me to be impossible. For starters, how do you even determine who contributes enough to society to be worthy of elite status. If someone doesn't contribute anything to society, does that mean that they have no value as a human being? But I think this idea of this sort of landlord who contributes nothing to society and just hoards his wealth is, is a caricature, really. Um, these might be the sorts of people who you'd think to dispossess first, the sorts of people who might be your first targets in the revolution, the people who live in their manor houses and appear to contribute nothing to society. However, it may not be what it seems. For example, what considerations have been made for their potentially positive environmental effects? It's long been the case in Britain that independent landowners have had a very good effect on the British countryside in having prevented tragedy of the commons-like effects. If you don't know what I mean by tragedy of the commons, essentially, let me, let me just give you an example. Let's say there is a shared resource, such as a lake, and no one owns the lake, and people want to fish from the lake. So everyone starts fishing from the lake, and people see that other people are fishing from the lake. So they think, well, if I don't fish soon, then all those other people are going to deplete the lake before I do which creates this inevitable cascade where everyone overfishes the lake until the resource is completely gone. This is known as the tragedy of the commons. One of the ways proposed to prevent outcomes like this is for the state to have control. And there may be cases where that is necessary, but one of the solutions to this, which does not require state control, and which has worked in Britain, in my country, for a very long time, is where an independent person owns a resource. And so, for example, in the case of the lake, a, a landowner could own the lake. Let's say he, he acquires the lake because he has a particular interest in owning the, the lake for, for fishing rights. And in owning the lake, he prevents a tragedy of the commons outcome. And now he can hire people or allow people fishing permits so that they can come and fish when they like. He can create 
a sustainable economy by owning the land for himself, by owning this particular resource and taking on the risk and the responsibility of managing this land. What I'm trying to point out really is that it's easy to see a lord in his manor house and become envious of him and what he has, but it's much harder to see the benefit which he is providing for the rest of society in owning all of this land. In owning the land, he has deprived everyone else the right to do whatever they want with it, which is precisely the benefit. The whole point of a landowner owning the land is so that we do not produce tragedy of the commons outcomes. Thanks to good environmental laws which protect our countryside and limit development in British countryside, we now have a situation in which it may seem unfair that so many landowners own a huge proportion of the land, but we can actually now enjoy the countryside without it being destroyed. It's precisely because we don't own the land and an elite does that the countryside is protected because the, the tendency of the general public to destroy a shared resource has been removed because all of the responsibility for that land has been placed in the hands of a few people. And because we have good access rights in this country, we can still enjoy the countryside for what it is and not have the responsibility of having to take care of it. Another simple reason to oppose the people who oppose elitism is because they are annoying. And I just have this feeling that for all the flaws that the elites may have, for all the unfairness that may be present there, there is something sinister about the people who want to do away with them. And I just have this feeling, it's not just a feeling, it's, it's, it can be found in historical evidence, that these people will produce a world which is worse than the, than the one they criticise. I take a similar stance on those who want to pull down the statues of those people who they've deemed are not worthy of having a legacy wrought in stone or metal. The fact that they want to pull down the statues is my primary reason for wanting the statues to stay up. For example, I don't particularly like Cecil Rhodes, don't really like the man, don't like much of what I've read about him, uh, but he has a statue in, I think, in Oxford University, and people want to pull it down because of his history, his association with racism and colonialism. and. Though I don't really like the statue, and I don't, I, I'm more or less Protestant in my reluctance to accept statue building in the first place, but because these people want to remove the statues, I want them to stay up, because I think that their, their desire to tear things down is more dangerous than the existence of statues which commemorate people who might not have the most savoury of pasts. In other words, I think that those who wish to tear down statues and dismantle elites actually represent a kind of evil which is probably more sinister than the regular sort of corruption and snobbery which you might find in any typical elite in this country.